I'm always on the lookout for interesting new watercolours. So when Paul Rubens asked me if I would like to try out these Kiyome watercolours, I said yes. I need to say that up front. These were sent to me for free. I'm not being paid to make this video. Anything in this film are my own opinions. I believe you say Kiyome. I've seen it or heard it pronounced differently, but uh, that's how I'm going to say it and I apologise if that's wrong. I'm particularly interested in the set because I'm always looking out for very portable sets that I can take out urban sketching. So I think the best thing is for me not to witter and to, to um, open this up, have a look and then I thought we'd swatch them out. Oh, that's pretty. It's got a sort of luster to it. Let's get that plastic off. Before we actually look at the set, just check here. I love this. Paul Rubens will make more people like Chinese colours. Um, I think quite a lot of people like them already. All the information about pigment numbers, opacity and light fastness are on the back. So that is really useful. I may cut that out and keep it. I'll check whether it's fairly accurate against what we swatch first. There are 24 colours in here, little half pans. <laughs> always, oh my lord, the first problem is always getting into oh, to the palette. Okay, it's got a sort of sticky, sticky thing protecting all the paints. which has the information on it that we had on the back there. So I might, I could always just stick that on a piece of paper and keep that. Just looking at the, the box, it seems pretty sturdy and it's got a little tool, which I presume yep, lifts out that palette so that you can use that as a mixing well and I guess you can use that as a mixing well. So that's kind of cool. And I presume the other thing that I'm going to use this for is if I want to change out <laughs> or not, surely that must be designed to let me change out the half pans. Try something a little no, well, there's got to be a knack to this that I... Ah, that one's coming. I know you want them tight so they won't fall out. Yeah, OK. <laughs> right, I might edit that out. So, OK, the pans do come out. They are little half pans. And that would be handy if, say, there was colour in here that you really don't like, never going to use and it's missing a favourite one, you can swap yours in. As you saw, they, they do fit pretty tightly. Let's, I'll be brave and turn it up. Oh, no. OK, they fit quite tight, except for the ones that fall out. Well, that's stupid of me, isn't it? All right, we'll put those back. I was going to say, it's good that they fit so tight, so if you were taking this out and about and you dropped it, they wouldn't all fall out, but maybe they would. I would always suggest spraying your palette before you start. It just loosens up the colour and it'll mean that it's far easier to pick the colour up. So at the end, try and leave your palette open so that it can dry out. What I should also point out, it seems that these are wet poured paints. You can see that by the way that you've got a little sort of concave surface on them rather than extruded and then cut up. Looking at all this different information, it does give you the pigment information. Some of them are single pigments, most of them are a mix. This is a student quality range rather than artist quality range. So I'm not surprised to see that we, we've got things like cadmium yellow hue. Just if you didn't know, if you ever see hue after 
the name. It just means it's been formulated to look like that colour, but usually using cheaper pigments or potentially the original colour isn't available and therefore the chemists have mixed pigments to to make that colour. So it doesn't mean they're, they're bad, it just means that they, they are produced more to a price point usually. This is my swatching paper. I've written the names. The black line is so I can judge the opacity and what I'm going to do is swatch them all out and see what we think of the colours, see how easily they come off. I mean not, not a lot to see there with Chinese white as you would expect it starts to veil the line it's not particularly opaque but uh, you wouldn't expect anything else. Just think maybe the best thing is to wet the entire swatch and then I can also get a bit of a judgment about how it moves in with the water. So lemon yellow I would always expect to be pretty opaque too. Sorry I didn't wet that, did I, before I put it down. I must concentrate. Okay, that cadmium yellow, pale, is a really pretty colour and doesn't appear to be very opaque. We'll judge this, of course, when it actually dries. I'm intrigued about the gamboge because I find gamboge one of those really quite variable colours. If you look at it when it's in the pan or fresh out of a tube, I'm sorry, I always describe it as looking like baby poo. It's that sort of colour. The moment you get it onto the page it usually comes out and that is really pretty and looking very transparent this is cadmium red pale Let's see how that thins down the next is cadmium red and then we have cadmium red deep i'm looking at them in here and that looks like cadmium red deep and that looks like cadmium oh no no okay i take it all back in the pans i thought they'd got them in the wrong sections but on the on the surface that is indeed cadmium red and then cadmium red deep which you can see is a lot uh, cooler i'm going to check this and i may be wrong but so cadmium red pale, they say is PY65 and PY255. Now PY means yellow, so they say those are two yellow pigments, which doesn't seem right. I mean, I'll have to look at those up and I'll let you know whether that's right or wrong. Might be a printing error. So this is permanent rose. Oh, and that is a pretty colour. Alizarin. I love alizarin. Again, I'm just going to check pigment afterwards because alizarin often isn't permanent. But they give this, let's have a check. Yeah, that gets a four stars on the permanence rating. Lake, I am intrigued about. Oh, look at that. Isn't that a pretty colour? We like that. This is cerulean. Just gonna pop this up slightly to see if that encourages any any movement. And then we've got cobalt blue. That looks quite opaque. Let's just have another little look. Yes, it's got PW5 in, so that's what I would expect. This is that ultramarine. I know I've pre-wet this but I have to say the colours are picking up very easily. I'm not having to scrub at the pans at all. This is intense blue which you and I would call fallow blue. 
and indeed it is beautiful one of my favorite colors no, actually i've got all of them are my favorite colors <laughs> so indigo oh that's nice that's a gutsy color so what's that got in okay so that's got pb15 which is the intense blue it's got black and pb29 which i can't remember off the top of my head so that's got three, three pigments in including a black pigment but look at how it's feathering through the water and to the final row sap green it's a very handy sort of pre-mix green hookers not one of my favorites usually but actually that's quite pleasant emerald i presume is yeah pretty much a viridian type green not the color of any grass you'll have ever seen in your life but very nice alizarin and that emerald mixed together would make a great neutral color burnt sienna again is one of my favorite colors so I'm always a little prejudiced if a set hasn't got a decent burnt sienna, but that's not too bad. Okay, let's go for our raw umber. That will be... Mm, I may have, in fact, I think that is the burnt umber. Do you remember a couple of them fell out? I think that's burnt umber looking at it. So I need to swap those two round. Because I think that is Van Dyke. And then, of course, Ivory Black. Ivory Black is made from burnt bones as a sort of byproduct of the meat industry. So if you're vegetarian, you will not be wanting to use that. I'm going to let those dry and then we'll come back and look at them and st really be able to judge those colours more accurately. As this was drying I noticed quite a colour shift, particularly say up on these reds and the, the, the purples, they really seem to be going back somewhat. So what I've done, and I haven't filmed it because it's just the same thing again, I've just put a stripe of each colour over the top which will help me to see how they're layering and help with that opacity so I need to let that dry. Meanwhile I've had a little think about that sticky label and yeah I can cut out this but it seems a shame not to Ooh, do something with this so I've just got a old bit of watercolour paper and I can stick that on there and it is slightly larger than the information on there and keep it in the lid if I want. I could have just stuck it say on the bottom of that pan and I'd have had it to hand. If you're using that for mixing you're not going and you want some information you're not going to turn it over so I don't think that was entirely satisfactory. So I could have just stuck it on top of the lid but I quite like the luster on it so I'm not going to do that. Given that they've provided it to us we might as well keep it. Again while that's drying let's just see how some of these colours behave wet in wet. Indigo, I noticed, was very lively on the surface. So I wondered how that would behave just wet in wet. Get some lovely feathering. The Purple Lake I really liked as a colour. And again, get some very nice feathering there. But I did notice a really strong colour shift as it dried. Now what other colours? So this is the lemon yellow. Let's grab the cadmium yellow. Oh, that's livelier than I anticipated. Cadmium yellow often could be a bit truculent, but that's rather nice. Oh, tell you what I did look while this was drying as well. There is a printing mistake on here. Um, the cadmium red pale is put down as PY65 and PY255. That should be PR255. So do check some of those um, 
pigment codes if you're looking at those. To be honest, I don't pay a lot of attention to pigment codes unless I'm trying to recreate a particular colour. They can be incredibly useful, but just take these with a pinch of salt. These are feathering out and moving through the water quite a lot better than I was anticipating. I really thought because they are student grade and they haven't appeared to be particularly lively on the surface as I was doing those swatches, I'm quite excited by how they're behaving. Wet and wet is your thing. You might quite like these. I'm not seeing a huge evidence of granulation going on. Come back to those when they're dry as well. But that was quite nice. This is dry and we can make a judgment about some of that opacity now. Obviously Chinese white as we would expect is pretty opaque and the lemon yellow too. The cadmium um, yellow pale uh, is quite opaque. Cadmium yellow I would say semi-transparent. The gamboge is pretty transparent cadmium red pale oh, semi-transparent cadmium red is more opaque maybe semi-transparent maps i'm being harsh the cadmium red deep is pretty opaque here permanent rose is transparent this is interesting. If you look at the alizarin and the cadmium red deep and indeed the hookers light and the emerald, there's quite a shine on them where I've used them thick. Now that's probably not a problem because usually you're using thin washes, particularly if you're using it, say, pen and wash type applications. But I presume there is quite a lot of gum arabic in there and that's what's giving that gloss permanent red as we said transparent your alizarin is pretty transparent that's lake is quite transparent cerulean is fairly opaque cobalt blue is i'd say semi-transparent maybe opaque that ultramarine is quite opaque Fallow blue, transparent, hard to tell on the indigo to be honest. That green, semi transparent. The hooker's green, semi transparent. Emerald, transparent. Burnt sienna, transparent. Raw rumba, maybe semi opaque, semi transparent or opaque, quite a lot. Van Dyke looks quite transparent. The Burnt Umber looks pretty transparent, actually, which is a surprise. And then the Ivory Black, I can't tell. Really hard to judge black against black. But it's worth going through and just being aware of what your colours are doing, which ones are really transparent and which are opaque. There's nothing there that I'd look at and think, oh, not going to use that. One final thing that's quite useful when you're swatching is to see how things lift. So you just need a damp brush, clean damp brush, and to run it through your swatches and then to lift away any pigment that you've loosened. And why this is important, well, should you make a mistake, gosh, we never do that, do we? It's nice to know which colours you'll be able to amend and which colours you've got no hope on. Certain colours are what we would call staining, so no amount of scrubbing will ever lift them off the surface and get back to anywhere near the white of the paper. And other colours are a little easier to amend. Alizarin, for example, is one of those notorious staining colours. Some of the earth colours 
are easier to lift. And it's, yeah, super handy to know what's going on. Fallow is another notorious one for having the, someone described it as having the half-life of nuclear fuel. You know, you get it on you, you, it takes forever to get off your fingers. And if it won't come off your fingers, you can bet it won't come off your paper. Let's have a quick look. So, for example, the Purple Lake has hardly moved at all. Let me make sure that I wasn't lenient on it. No. So that's a really staining colour. Alizarin, really staining. Things like that, that emerald, really staining. Whereas if we look, say, at the raw umber, a lot of that has lifted. It's not back to the white of the paper, but a lot has lifted. That cadmium red deep, very little lifting. Yellows have lifted a bit better. Green has lifted well. So that's another great way of just testing your paints and getting to know them. What's my conclusion? Well, one thing I hadn't noticed at the beginning was that this is a, a black insert. And that's, oh, and I hadn't noticed that came off easily either. <laughs> but it's just come off in my hands. I'll come back to that. Yeah, the black insert I think is really rather good because I'm a really mucky worker. Look at my hands, you can tell. Um, and actually having the black makes it look a lot better than most of my paint block boxes. I think it's a nice design. I think that's kind of cool that that comes off. So you could use that as a separate mixing well and move that around and it's pretty deep. So I really like the design of this. The fact that they give you information despite a couple of those codes actually being wrong. Well, fine, we can live with that. We can work it out ourselves. The colours come out nicely, though there is quite a colour shift as they're drying. So particularly, I noticed it on that cadmium red deep and the purple lake. There may have been others that I just am not as conscious of. Just there isn't a Prussian blue and Prussian blue is one of my favourite colours. So that's a real, real shame. Pleasantly surprised at the lovely soft edges that you could get working wet in wet. Some of that nice feathering we saw hasn't really stayed as it's dried, but we've got very good soft edges. Really react with dropping water in to form blooms. In fact, I'm not seeing blooms anywhere. So I think that's a shame because I really like blooms in watercolour. If you don't like them, you might be very pleased pleased that then they're not appearing. Right at the beginning I laughed a bit because it said Paul Rubens will make more people like Chinese colours. Well I have to say I do like this little set. I like the design of the box, I like the fact that you've got the palette that you can lift out and that you can take that lid off and use it as a big mixing well. I think on the whole the colours are pretty good. Though, as I say, I did notice quite a drying, shifting colour. None of them are really opaque and heavy. They certainly seem to respond well wet and wet. I would say this would make a nice little set for being out and about. I think for an urban sketcher, it's pretty compact and it seems fairly robust. So if you're looking for a small student quality set, I think this could be pretty good. In the US, it costs $25 and I am still trying to find the UK price because I cannot actually find it for sale in the UK at the moment. But I've contacted Paul Rubens, so I will come back and update you on the price in the UK. Hi, this is Future Liz here. I had finished editing my review and then I got an email from Paul Rubens answering my questions which I appreciate because they came back to me ever so quickly. But it does contain some new information. First of all, they said that this watercolour set is only currently available in America, Britain and Germany. And I wouldn't have done the review if I'd realised that because I can think of nothing more annoying than watching a review thinking, oh, that looks nice, just what I'm after. Good price, yeah, yeah, nice colours, oh, like the design, 
and then finding that because you live in Australia, you can't get hold of it. Or in this case, because you live in France, you can't get hold of it. So I do apologise for that. I wasn't aware when I started the review. The second thing is they confirmed that, yes, it is on sale in the UK, but they don't sell it under the name Kione. If you've got packaging like this with an unusual name, Kiyome, which means beautiful, you'd have thought that when you list it on Amazon, you would put that in the title because that's what people are searching for. Apparently not. They just call it the Paul Rubens 24 half pan set. So if that's what you're looking for, that's what you need to search for. I will put links in the description. The third thing they confirmed was price. So in America, the recommended retail price is $28.99. And that seems pretty good to me for this nicely designed, pretty richly pigmented set. But in the UK, the recommended retail price is £34.99. If you do a quick translation of $28.99 to pounds, that comes out to about £22.50. And yet they're charging £34.99 in the UK. That's 50% more. And that may affect my recommendation. In Germany, it's €39.99, Euros, which is in line with the UK price, but still 50% more than the US price. Given that these are made in China, is it easier to transport to the US than to support, transport to Europe? I thought it was pretty much on, on a par, so I don't know why there is such a big price difference. And as I say, that may affect the balance of, ooh, this is a nice set. Hmm, that's the price. So if you are a US urban sketcher, I would have no hesitation in saying, this is a nice set at a good price, well designed, good looking colours, light fast, etc. If you are an urban sketcher, watercolourist in Europe, price balance is different and my recommendation therefore wouldn't be as strong as it is for any American viewers. You need to decide whether that's a price point you're comfortable with. I hope you found this review useful and I'll continue on my search for interesting watercolours and share those and review them when I come across them.